Hello and welcome to the course Introduction to the Psychology of Language. I am Ark Verma from IIT Kanpur. Uh, we are uh, in the uh, seventh week of uh, the course, and in this uh, seventh week of the course, and uh, now we'll be talking about the last uh, lecture of the uh, week. Now, in this uh, lecture, I'll talk to you about aphasia, which is a particular disorder of language, results basically from damage to the areas of the brain that are involved in processing different aspects of language. So, let us uh, try and talk about that. Now, even before we go there, uh, let us try and recount what we have been doing, uh, you know, about doing here uh, so far uh, and that is basically to try and uncover the anatomy of the language, to uncover basically, you know, uh, questions, to answer questions like say for example, language per se has so many different component processes, things that are involved in acquisition, things that are involved in production and comprehension and uh, what are these different component processes. So one of the very important aspects even before you ask a, a question about the anatomy of the language is anatomy of the language is that what are the component processes because uh, it, it cannot be that one area of the brain is solely dedicated to all things language and uh, nothing else or say for example language is, is a fairly uh, you know, uh, a fairly deconstructible process in a sense that you can say for example, okay, this is production, this is comprehension, this is something else, uh, this is the prosodical parts. So, all of that can be done. If you kind of can come up to a atomization of what language uh, broadly is and uh, into what kind of component functions it can be broken down to, uh, then the question makes sense that, okay, uh, does uh, there is there one area in the brain that uh, takes care of all of these component functions or all of these component functions are distributed across the brain distributed across different areas in the brain okay so then that's that question sort of makes sense the another another question that you can ask is also say for example is suppose you say that areas x y and z uh, take care of component uh, component uh, you know functions uh, a b and c uh, is this true for everybody? Is uh, you know is every person's brain wired in much the same way as far as language is concerned? So there are these two three questions that uh, you know people actually generally put up when they are uh, talking uh, you know or trying to uh, read or investigate about the anatomy of language or the neural basis of language. And uh, as you know, uh, and I've talked about this earlier as well, there are two at least very two very important methods that scientists use. One is, uh, you know, neural imaging the normal individual's brain, you know, you give, the, you get these individuals to the lab, you ask them to perform particular language uh, functions and then you are sort of, you know, checking their brain out in terms of, okay, when production was happening, uh, these are the areas that lit up, if uh, comprehension is uh, given, these are the areas of the brain that lit up and that ways. A very important source uh, of this sort of information actually also comes from uh, assessing the linguistic abilities of individuals who have suffered some form of brain damage. So, the idea is and this is where it all started uh, basically a long time ago, this is where it all started when uh, you look at uh, the individual's brain who has some major lesion or uh, you know damage to the brain and you kind of say Acha, corresponding to this damage in this area of the brain, what are the cognitive abilities that are lost and that kind of helps you make you know direct connections between uh, the brain areas of the brain and the cognitive functions. Now, both these methods have been used by you know ling uh, linguists and uh, neuroscientists and psycholinguists uh, to look at uh, the various component processes of language and their neural basis. So, uh, if you try and sum up all of what we have done in this week, if you try and make a summary of all of that, this is sort of uh, these are sort of the areas that we have majorly talked about. So, in the figure you can see that in uh, purple is the Broca's area has been mentioned so many times. Uh, here below that is the inferior frontal cortex. I talked to you about superior and inferior in the last class. Then this one is the sylvan feature, the, ru uh, the ridge that is there, uh, you know, in the that separates the, the frontal and the temporal lobe. This particular ridge uh, right here. Uh, this ridge is called the uh, uh, you know so, uh, sylvian fissure then you have the superior temporal gyrus this particular uh, you know bulged is called superior temporal gyrus here you have uh, basically this uh, the vernix area in light blue you have the inferior parietal lobule uh, here and then you have the supra marginal gyrus here uh, this one uh, so you have all of these areas which are basically implicated in different degrees 
uh, to uh, actually performing the different component processes of language. Let us kind of look at it uh, in some detail. Now, much of the language processing areas are actually organized around this Sylvian feature, the, the feature that I was talking to you about, this one. Okay. Language basically in that sense, uh, yeah. So, language areas generally include the left temporal cortex which has the vernix area uh, here and in the posterior temporal gyrus in the back portion of this temporal gyrus and uh, the left anterior temporal cortex. So, left part and the front uh, a little bit, the inferior parietal lobule and the left insular cortex basically which includes the uh, Broca series. So, this is the set of areas that is being implicated. Correctively, all of these regions uh, are supposed to uh, construct what is called the left perisylvian language network. So, uh, just uh, in mostly in the left side and around the sylvian feature, this is the network of language. This is the, the set of areas that are basically involved in uh, understanding or producing language. Now, uh, it is not that the right hemisphere does not do anything, the right hemisphere basically also participates in uh, certain specific aspects of language processing. For example, the right superior temporal sulcus actually helps in processing prosody, uh, which is the you know tonal quality, uh, tonal aspects of uh, speech. Now, the right prefrontal cortex and the middle temporal gyrus and the posterior cingulate gyrus actually lights up in response to metaphors. Uh, so, humor, metaphor comprehension, irony, all of those figurative aspects of uh, language are uh, majorly mediated by the right hemisphere regions as well. Okay. Uh, further say for example, as language production, perception and comprehension involve both motor movement and temporal aspects, the entire set of cortical that is premotor cortex, motor cortex and SMA and subcortical the thalamal, uh, the thalami, uh, basal ganglia and cerebellum are also activated at different uh, times when language production or comprehension is being carried out. So, this is just to sum up the anatomy of language, this is all of the areas that we have talked about till now. Okay. So, having done that, let us move to aphasia now. Okay. Now, aphasia basically uh, is, is a very interesting disorder and there is a very interesting story attached to how uh, aphasia kind of uh, you know was discovered and it came up and it uh, so happened that there is this French neurosurgeon called Paul Broca uh, came across this particular patient called M. Lebogne and Lebogne uh, basically, I am probably not pronounci uh, pronouncing the name uh, correct, but Lebon basically let us call him Lebon. So, uh, this patient called Lebon uh, uh, came to uh, Paul Broca and Paul Broca observed that this guy had severe impairments in production of speech and uh, he could attempt even if he, he could uh, you know he was trying to say something he could not say much he could at best with a lot of effort only say things like tan. So, that is why uh, in, in a lot of neuropsychology in a lot of neuroscience he is known as Tan itself and the, his name kind of started to be called Tan because he could only utter Tan and uh, maybe some swear words etc because of uh, frustration that nobody is understanding him. But majorly this guy had very severe impairments in production of speech. Now, in some time also uh, Paul Broca uh, again came across another patient called uh, Lelong who also had severe impairments in speech production and could hardly say uh, about a maximum of around 5 words. Now, there was hardly uh, you know, anything uh, that Broca could actually do to uh, you know solve the difficulties and the, both the patients died uh, shortly after, but once they died Broca tried to study their brain and they found and he found that they had both of them had extensive damage to the frontal lobes of their brain. So, uh, the frontal lobes mostly in the left hemisphere were extensively damaged and that is what was basically you know that kind of damage was what uh, was attributed as the source of their language or speech production difficulties. The conclusion uh, that was made and uh, in the conclusion that was made on the basis of these two patients uh, basically was that specific parts of the brain might be involved in performing specific mental functions. This was the beginning of the localization era so to speak and kind of laid the foundation for a lot of later research that happened in cognitive neuroscience. Uh, this particular area that uh, Broca found out was directly responsible for uh, production of speech and lesion to which can lead to impairments in production of speech later came to be known as Broca's area and uh, loosely the, the symptoms of uh, this particular uh, you know speech production disorder uh, clubbed uh, were clubbed together under what was called Broca's aphasia. Now, this was one part of the story. The next thing uh, that uh, also very importantly happened was that there was this guy uh, Karl uh, Wernick as a German uh, doctor. He came across two patients, Suzanne Adam and Suzanne uh, Rother 
and uh, both of these patients presented a slightly different uh, profile of language deficits. Uh, their difficulties are more about comprehension of language, uh, both spoken and written. Obviously, they, they, whenever they sp uh, spoke also would have had certain kinds of difficulties, but majorly their problem was about understanding language. Uh, they could not really understand a lot. Okay, and even if they even if they were speaking, they were making up new words, and there were basically a lot of semantic anomalies. Uh, remember, in four hundred in the in the lecture before the last one, so they were kind of speaking uh, completely in in a sort of a sense that didn't really make a lot of sense. Now, one of these patients, I think, uh, probably uh, so, uh, so, uh, you know, Suzanne Adam. Uh, had absolutely zero comprehension uh, ability and when she was examined after her uh, death, uh, it, uh, it was found that she had extensive lesions in the posterior portions of the brain, you know more towards the uh, uh, temporal parts of the brain, uh, basically at the intersection of the temporal parietal and occipital uh, lobes. So, that is what we saw some time back. Now, this area eventually then uh, came to be known as Wernick's area because Wernick was the first one who kind of came across these patients, linked the damage of these areas to their uh, language comprehension abilities and this kind of profile basically was clubbed under uh, very loosely what is called Wernick's aphasia. So, these are the two kinds of things that happened. Now, on the basis of uh, the work that uh, Broca uh, kind of uh, had done and uh, Wernick kind of furthered that work, he investigated a lot. And basically, along with uh, two other uh, prominent scientists of the time, Lichtheim and Geschwind, uh, basically they together gave a particular model of how language might be organized in the brain. Now, this is a very, very important model and a very important model for mainly for neuropsychologists who ha actually kind of on the basis of these models, uh, you know, uh, create and test predictions of uh, what kind of damages would lead to what kind of language difficulty, what kind of damages in the brain would lead to what kind of difficulties in language. Now, this model came to be known as the wernick lichtheim geschwind model, is one of the classical and one of the most important models of language organization. And this model basically uh, rested on the basic assumption that perception and production of language are taken care of by separate systems in the brain. So, this is the time where people already start saying, okay, language production system is different, language comprehension system is different and obviously they must interact at a particular point. So, they said that perception of language relies mostly on the posterior part of parts of the brain that is the temporal and the parietal lobes and production of language basically relies on the anterior portions of the brain, the frontal lobe and parts of the association cortex in the front part of the motor cortex. According to this particular model, according to the wernick lichtheim geschwin model or the WLG model which we might uh, say three cortical structures in the left hemisphere are most important for processing and uh, producing language. Uh, this, the, there is this Wernick's area which includes the region at the junction of the temporal and parietal cortices, also includes the superior temporal lobe and the angular gyrus. This one, this region they said Wernick's area is responsible for the basic acoustic analysis of incoming auditory stimuli, you kind of break that down into uh, you know phonemes and create the phonological code and from the phonological code you kind of uh, make up meaning. The angular gyrus, uh, an area behind the Wernick's area is also proposed to be involved in the analysis of visual input. So, both spoken input and visual input are both being analyzed in the Wernick's area or uh, surrounding areas and this is the area that is helping us comprehend stuff. Then there is the Broca's area in the left inferior frontal lobe and which is directly implicated in production of speech and then there is this connections of uh, white matter, the bundle of white matter that was uh, found to be connecting the uh, Broca's area in the front and the vertex area in the back and these connections basically were being done by these fiber tracks uh, which were uh, together referred to as the arcuate fasciculus. Now, this arcuate fasciculus basically performed the major job of relaying the phonological information to the motor stores and also say for example, uh, you know uh, basically because these two areas will need to talk. In order to see, for example, if we speak, we understand as well, and when we understand, we can speak that as well. So, that kind of communications uh, basically uh, were to happen between the uh, Wernix and the Broca's area, and this communication or the uh, conduction of information, really of information, was done by this bundle of white matter called the arcuate fasciculus. Now, according to the Wernick Lichtheim Geschwind model, these three areas together uh, would help us perform the basic semantic and syntactic analysis of language. Also, they are able to facilitate uh, speech production that is both fluent and meaningful. So, if any of these connections were to be damaged, that would lead to different kinds of difficulties. 
Vernix area would help in storing and conceptual and semantic uh, representations as well as lexical information which we saw that is uh, present in the uh, uh, mental lexicon. It is also uh, responsible for uh, the storing the phonological code for words. The Broca's area was implied in syntactical processing and constructing grammatical sequences and the arcade fasciculus as I was saying is basically proposed to relay semantic and lexical information about words uh, from the conceptual representations in the uh, Wernick area to the uh, written and spoken production areas in the um, you know uh, re uh, regions in the Broca's area or thereabouts. Further the WLC model uh, identifies three types of disorders that might result if any of these uh, areas were to get damaged or the connections between them were to get damaged. So, uh, the, pro propos the proposals were like uh, damage to the vernix area would lead to problems in speech perception, particularly uh, comprehension and more specifically the damage to this area would lead to problems connecting the sound and the meaning representations, okay, leading to impaired comprehension. So, this is basically what is the major uh, problem here. Further, the speech planning centers would also now find it difficult because they do not have the phonological code to speak correctly. So, they will not, they will find it difficult to uh, create correct phonological representations. That is what was leading to, that was what would lead to uh, essentially meaningless speech. So, this is basically the profile of the Wernix physics. If Broca's area were to get damaged, this would interfere with the formation of grammatically incorrect, uh, grammatically correct sentences. Also, planning and executing the motor movements for speech production, you know, moving all these articulators would become very difficult. It will also lead to something like apraxia of speech, you know, uh, you know, uh, hesitated, uh, halted telegraphic uh, kind of speech, and that will probably characterize mainly Broca's aphasia. Damage to the arcuate fasciculus will inhibit the communication between the vernix and the Broca's areas and therefore will lead to problem with repeating input sentences, but sparing the uh, ability to comprehend and produce meaningful speech. So, uh, both areas vernix and Broca's are alright, but the connection between them is broken. So, by themselves they will probably be able to do some things, uh, but uh, you know being able to repeat uh, this, uh, something that is heard is kind of going to uh, be suffered. So, that is the conduction aphasia profile. Now, we kind of have talked about the model, uh, we have kind of talked about its uh, implications. Let us now look at some of these uh, detail, uh, some of these disorders in some detail. Now, this is by the way the Wernick uh, uh, Lichtheim uh, Geschwind model. You can see that on the top there are these conceptual centers in B. Uh, the uh, Wernick's area is basically represented by A and Broca's area is represented by M. So, damage to M basically is leading to Broca's aphasia, damage to A is leading to Wernick's aphasia and there are also disorders that are happening uh, if the connections are getting damaged. So, if the connection between A and M is damaged, you see conduction aphasia uh, appearing and there are also if M and B is damaged, you have transcortical motor aphasia, M and B is happening, then you have transcortical motor aphasia, if A and B connection is uh, going off, then you have transcortical sensory aphasia. Now, this is the model. Let us look at uh, this model in more in a little bit more detail. What is happening in Broca's aphasia? It kind of almost sounds like a repetition, but say for example, Broca's aphasia typically happens because of lesions in the posterior portions of the left inferior frontal gyrus, which uh, kind of composes uh, is composed of the uh, pars triangularis and pars opercularis. Okay, uh, Broca's aphasia is also known by several different names like agrammatic aphasia expressive aphasia, anterior aphasia or non-fluent aphasia because the speech is non-fluent, it is about expression and so on. Basically, this uh, kind of profile of damage led Broca to conclude that these are the areas which are specifically responsible for production of speech. Patients uh, of uh, Broca's aphasia usually uh, are characterized by single speech utterances. So, like for example, Le Bourgne, uh, could only say tan, 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 they could say nothing else. So, people would just probably be able to say one word or two words at a time uh, or sometimes very short and simple uh, phrases, sometimes unintelligible mutterings. Uh, even if say for example, if uh, you know the damage is not so severe and people can create some sentences, uh, they would the sentences would mostly be like uh, you know uh, lacking functional uh, words, uh, more like say for example, just contained words, so noun, noun, noun. So, uh, rat eat cat, rat is eating the cat, something uh, like that will not be there, actually cat eating the rat and they also be uh, fairly deficient in grammatical construction. So, the uh, sentences, the constructions that these people will make will uh, hardly be any, gramma uh, hardly be grammatical. 
the manner of the speech the way in which they speak is, will also be uh, telegraphic coming in uneven burst and also very very effort effortful so they will not be able to do that uh, in addition uh, say for example a certain uh, subclass could be that you know they have complete uh, they may demo demonstrate comprehension deficits relating to understanding and producing uh, you know complicated uh, syntactical structures so this subtype could be called agrammatic aphasia now recent research however suggests that it's not only this set of areas that uh, could lead to uh, broca's aphasia or similar symptoms it could be other areas as well which would involve the insular cortex and the basal ganglia and some other areas as well uh, this is uh, basically what the broca's area looks like and you have the pars triangularis and the pars opercularis here in combination all of this is referred to as the broca's area now let's talk about the vernix aphasia as we had uh, as we said earlier patients with vernix aphasia will have difficulty uh, in understanding spoken or written language uh, also while the speech uh, say for example while be fluent and uh, prosody would be normal it would essentially be meaningless okay uh, vernix aphasia has been linked to damage mainly in the posterior regions of the superior temporal gyrus so back of the superior temporal gyrus and uh, have some lesions uh, basically uh, in other relevant areas uh, say for example the near the sts and others could also lead to uh, similar symptoms like in vernix aphasia now more recent studies have suggested that in addition to vernix area uh, region surrounding the in the surrounding cortex areas in the surrounding cortex of the temporal lobe uh, or say for example damage to underlying white matter could also kind of lead to uh, you know is also necessary actually to produce permanent vernix aphasia like symptoms just uh, uh, small damage to vernix area or the you know the temporal lobe might not uh, lead to uh, vernix aphasia other regions in addition are also needed now coming to conduction aphasia uh, conduction aphasia basically as i was saying is results from the damage between uh, damage to uh, the white matter tracts that connect uh, broca's area with uh, vernix area uh, patients basically uh, can understand uh, the words that they hear or see and they can hear their own speech errors but they don't they are not able to uh, you know perform any kinds of online correction they will not be able to correct these things on the fly uh, these patients also show problem in producing spontaneous speech as well as repeating speech that they have heard you know generally people can kind of uh, do that uh, now moving further uh, if you saw that the connection if the damage is between uh, you know the conceptual areas b and uh, you know uh, uh, vernix area a uh, this would basically lead to a particular profile uh, which will be called transcortical sensory aphasia and the profile would look like say for example people will be having the ability to comprehend words but they will not uh, you know have the ability to repeat uh, whatever they are hearing so this is that specific uh, kind of thing and uh, such a pattern would mainly result out of uh, lesion to the supramarginal and the angular gyri of uh, these patients such findings kind of actually hint that aphasia this sort of aphasia might be resulting from the loss of the ability to access semantic information without really losing uh, the syntactic and phonological uh, abilities because anyways the broca's area is still all right okay another disconnection syndrome uh, transcortical motor aphasia can happen when broca's area and uh, the concept centers that connection is damaged we will we'll see that uh, very shortly okay now this basically would uh, uh, result in say for example uh, the damage to this one and this basically could uh, result in a sort of a profile where uh, you know production of speech is uh, affected and it could be uh, you know meaningless the concept centers and what is being said is kind of uh, you know that connection is gone finally if somebody has extensive damage to the entire left hemisphere you know all of these areas that we have talked about uh, the left periselvian uh, region uh, and uh, temporal regions as well as frontal regions all of them are kind of get damaged the connections between uh, them also get damaged then you can say that the person would uh, suffer from what is referred to as uh, global aphasia which will basically uh, lead down uh, you know uh, lead one to actually uh, experience complete breakdown of both language production and comprehension processes that kind of profile would be referred to as global aphasia so let us look at this once again you have the concept centers the conceptual store uh, in b you have broca's uh, broca's area in m and you have vernix area in a and basically uh, now you can probably understand the figure a little better damage to a leading to vernix aphasia m leading to broca's aphasia 
uh, damage to the connection between them leads to conduction aphasia. Connections between brokers and uh, uh, concept areas leads to motor aphasia. Uh, connection between uh, vernix, aphasia, uh, vernix area and concept centers leads to transcortical sensory aphasia. This is also further uh, uh, you can see some of the, uh, the connections uh, actually between uh, uh, Broca's area and uh, Vernix area. That is all that I wanted to talk to you about aphasia and eventually the entire uh, chapter on neural basis of uh, language comprehension. Thank you.